Good morning, Deify here, and welcome back to Katawa Shoujo, where we just had a run-in, <laughs> literally, with Amy, and, uh, and then uh, Misha and Shizune went off into their student council lunch, whatever, I guess I'm not invited, because I didn't feel like joining student council, but uh, now we get to move forward, we just had lunch alone, so I eh, know that's a little sad, but... I'm sure all things will go out just fine, right? The lunch and the afternoon class pass uneventfully. Oh, that's good. School's over. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I read most of the book I had started yesterday and eat some of the mostly inedible offerings at the cafeteria. The class is tiresome. The teacher seems like an okay person despite the weird first impression I got, and the material is relatively interesting. However, the way he teaches is really bizarre. It's as if he expects that everyone is a natural genius. When the final bell sounds, I realize that there is still a lot of time left in the day, and I'm left wondering what to do. It's odd. At the hospital, I had 24 hours a day of free time, but here, filling the considerably shorter hours feels difficult. Everyone else leaves, and I'm left alone with the teacher. Muto is examining the assignment sheets we were working on earlier, marking them with a red ball pen. Raising his eyes from his papers briefly, he notices me and furrows his brow. What is it, Nakai? I jump at him addressing me, but I guess it's natural to spark some conversation since there is nobody else around. Um, nothing. Thinking about what I'd do after school. The teacher slowly puts the cap on the pen he is holding and arranges his papers into a stack, clacking it against the desk twice, as every adult is wont to do in uh, this world. Just. That is just like shuffling of papers. Is, is that like some kind of symbolism that I'm not getting? Just like the useless waste of time to, I don't know. He seems very methodical and for a brief moment I'm reminded of Shizune. But the teacher is more unhurried and relaxed, much more routined. You have no plans? No, I considered joining a club, but don't know what kind of club would interest me. Go observe a meeting of someone else's club. Might pique your interest. Yeah, I guess. I just... But I don't know how to continue from there. Muto looks at me in a, in a way that makes me quickly want to take the words back to avoid a conversation. But I can't, so I have to forge ahead. I just don't know how to deal with these people. Or <laughs> That's a little more pointed than the game intended. I just don't know how to deal with people. I mean the other students. I'm talking to people and everything, so it's not that I'd be isolated or anything. I just don't know what to think about... the disabilities. It's like... It feels that I'm being impolite if I pay attention to them, and it's weird to ignore them. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. The teacher scratches his cheek absentmindedly, looking very unresponsive. These things are only an issue if you make them one. You can talk normally with someone, even if they are blind or something. Try to look behind the superficial. There's not a single student here who isn't just a normal kid behind whatever they might seem at first glance. He says the same thing as Yuko did. I know they're right, but it's hard. How can you not consider, for example, Shizune's deafness, when the only way to communicate with her is to talk through Misha? Or Hanako. It's not like you can ignore her face. But... I'm interrupted by the door of the classroom suddenly slamming open. TEACHER! Misha crashes in, hand straight in an enthusiastic greeting, her voice loud and lively enough to wake the dead from their graves. Ah, good, I was worried we wouldn't get enough Misha in this episode, but she's always watching. She starts towards the teacher's desk with her bouncing step, hands energetically swinging with the rhythm. Muto, visibly dismayed at the interruption, and Misha in general, slumps in his chair. Mikado? Misha stops in her tracks and looks around cluelessly, as if she's sensing from his tone that something's wrong, but has no idea what. Yes? We have talked about volume control before. Yes? <laughs> but she doesn't lower her voice at all, and the teacher just rubs his eyes. So, what is it? I... We need help! 
and we're running out of supplies for the festival stands. This is a distress! She waves a pink slip of paper she's holding around. So, go get more supplies from the art room. What's the problem with that? Plywood! Plywood is the problem! Last time we wanted more, there was only a little, but that time we just took all it all and went with that. Now there's like none left there, so do you know where there is some? I don't understand. How would I know? Shichan, I mean the president thought that a teacher would know if there was plywood. Was she wrong? Muto looks like he is in great pain, frowning with his entire essence, and Misha doesn't get it at all. Looking at the two of them communicate is terrible. Like looking at a man being tortured by drilling his skull open while blasting pop music at full volume at the same time. What a metaphor. <laughs> it's a good one right there. I'm afraid I have no idea if there's any plywood in the school, let alone where it would be if there was any. Oh, what should I do? Perhaps try to find Mr. Nomia? I'm quite sure he would know where to find everything you need. You'd have to pry them from his cold, dead hands, but that's a different matter. Ah, I don't have time, we are so busy! She holds her head with both of her hands. Ah! <laughs> Looking as despairing as it's possible for a person like her. Without even noticing, she crumples the note she's holding against her hair. I shouldn't even be fetching these things, there's so much to do and we are falling behind the schedule! Muto looks at her gravely, and then suddenly smiles. Smiling doesn't really fit his face. I think it'd be better if he didn't. I uh, wonder if you could get some temporary help. He switches to staring at me, focusedly, with a hard expression. Me? me? As if trying to say, go make some friends. Uh, I guess I can give you a hand. You can? Thanks, Hee-chan, you're really nice. She pauses, does a double take, and then points at me with her finger, yelping, ah! And looking very puzzled. I don't know what, what kind of ah that's supposed to be, or is it like, ah! Maybe it's that one. Yeah, ah! Come to think of it, what's Hee-chan doing here? Class is over, you should be having fun! We just had a little chat. Oh no, it's not detention, is it? Are you in trouble, Hee-chan? No, I'm not. Is Hichan in trouble, teacher? No, he's not. Muto sighs deeply, and I feel that I have to help Misha to get her off the teacher's back. So, uh, what do you need? Here's a list. I can try to find the plywood from somewhere if there's none in the art room. She offers me the note she's holding. I take it, hesitating a bit. I said I'd help you, but this has no implications on whether I'm joining the council or not. Oh. Still. Thanks, Hichan. Try to be quick. We are in a stall building streak now. We must hurry, hurry, hurry! <laughs> she bounces out of the classroom, leaving me and the teacher looking at each other with something that feels like a silent agreement. She cray. <laughs> well, there you have it, Nakai. You have something to do now. Please don't sound so smug. Looking at the list with a number of items ranging from paint to plywood, all written with small, neat handwriting that is undoubtedly Shizune's, I heave a sigh. I'll be going, then. Waving the long list limply at the teacher, I exit to the hallway. The classrooms closest to ours are designated belonging to classes 3-1 and 3-2 on the right side, and 3-4 on the left side, each door looking exactly the same. Wow, that almost makes sense! Who could have guessed? Further down the corridor, still with identical doors, are rooms that I didn't think were used for classes. I guess the art room is not a classroom as such. Carefully push open the furthest door, and peek in. It's a classroom, but it seems rather badly kept, or not in use. Am I in the right place? Desks and chairs are all around the room, a thin layer of dust settled on them. There are some easels in the corner, so at least this looks like the right place. The room is flushed in sunlight from the big windows, shadows creeping all over the desks. Specks of dust are dancing in the stagnant air, making the beams of light almost visible. Jokingly, I call into the empty room. Anybody home? Something catches my eye and I stop mid-sentence. Sitting on a desk is a short-haired girl. 
curiously wearing a boy's uniform, with a fork between her toes, a morsel of food stuck firmly on the end. What a great character intro this is. I, this picture is just real good. This odd way of dining seems to be caused by her apparent lack of hands, but her presence here is what takes me aback even more. How did I miss her before? She's sitting in a corner very still, but I still somehow took her as part of a furnishing or a statue at first glance. I'm not being too observant today, as a whole. The girl seems to be frozen in place, staring at me with her huge eyes like a rabbit in headlights. She's staring at me, her mouth wide open, ready to accept the fork. I'm staring at her, my mouth wide open, suddenly remembering I didn't finish my sentence and trying to think if I should. This weird stalemate keeps us both stunned into silence, punctuated only by the wall clock ticking rhythmically. Hello. This girl stuffs the forkful into her mouth and is now staring at me expectantly while chewing. This is a bit awkward. Uh, hello. I was told to pick up some supplies from here. For some festival stalls, I think. I didn't know that there would be someone here. There isn't. That's why I came here, too. God, I need to figure out how to do her voice. Uh, it's just... I usually picture her with much, like, uh... Not deeper, per se, but more monotone, lifeless voice than I can really do. It's difficult. She picks up another forkful. Uh, doesn't that mean you're here, then? She raises her eyebrows as if she was suspecting my observation was false. You are pretty observant. I guess it does. But who are you? This girl's pretty straightforward, isn't she? I'm Nakai. He's Sao Nakai. I just transferred in on Monday. I'm Rin. Tezuka Rin. Rin Tezuka. I won't shake hands with you, but at least we know who we are now. That's very nice. Her deadpan manner of talking makes it hard to determine whether she's joking about shaking hands or not. It kind of bothers me. Joking about these matters doesn't feel very appropriate at all. But I do believe now we have met our final main character. Woohoo! Trying to think. I'm gonna be like missing someone super obvious, but I don't think I am. While I'm trying to figure out what's appropriate and whether this girl is, she seems to have lost interest in me and is now gazing yearningly back at her food. Can I continue my lunch? If you don't mind me, I won't mind you. If you need to get your stuff, the supplies are at the back. Go right ahead, but lunch? School's already over for the day. What word would you use then? There is no word for a meal you eat after lunch, but before dinner, right? It bothers me very much, too. But I don't really know what I should say. Dinch. Lunder. Or just make up a whole new word altogether. There we go. It's your... Fracknel. That's, that's the word for the meal between lunch and dinner. <laughs> oh, that was stupid. I don't think you're supposed to eat a meal between lunch and dinner to begin with. Whoa, you shut your mouth, he sow. I don't need that. But I'm hungry now, and my delicious box lunch would go to waste otherwise. Can't waste that bento right there. I have curry. It's very delicious. With much decisiveness, Rin once again picks up the fork between her toes, and with at least as much impoliteness, she points it straight at me. Okay, so with as much impoliteness as this is, that's, I don't like that sentence very much. <laughs> so, Nakai, what brings you to this place? Like I said, I was told to look for these things. No, the school. From outside, you look fine. Is your problem inside? I come to a full stop opening my mouth, but not getting a word out. God, I'm trying to do monotone for her, but I still have inflections in my voice. It's very difficult. Just like the question inflection. Like that one I heard super much on that last sentence. I... I can guess. I'm good at guessing. Better than most people. Rin cuts me off before I can answer her question, or skirt around it somehow. I don't know which I would have done. I froze in front of this issue again. I haven't even told anyone here about my condition. Or maybe it's only because it hasn't really come up. I do get the feeling that not making issues of this is a part of the social code here, as the teacher said. I wonder if the people here could relate. 
probably not any better than any normal person could. I can't relate to Shizune's circumstances, or Lily's either. Naturally, while I go through this in my head, Rin keeps considering what my condition could be, with an overtly contemplative look on her face. She puts the fork between her lips and leans back, looking at the ceiling as if the answer was written up there. A beam of light illuminates her face from the window side, creating a mask of dark shadow on the other side. Imagery. I don't think it's anything in your head, and something in your guts would be boringly ordinary like this lunch of mine, and less delicious. The problem must be in your pants. This messed up Sherlock Holmes kind of statement and the sheer lack of tact it was delivered with catches me completely off guard. I think I might have reeled back even physically as Breen's eyes widen in revelation and astonishment. So I was right. There's something wrong with your tackle, isn't there? Still partially in shock, but recognizing the need to reply something, I spit out the first thing I can think of. N no Nothing like that. I have a heart problem. Arrhythmia! Yeah, a good cover. I'm sure that's believable right there. <laughs> I said it. More like blurted it out, but I said it. The girl in front of me purses her lips together and glowers at me, looking very disappointed. How boring. Trouble in the pants would have been much more scandalous. What's with this reaction? I I'm sorry to let you down? I forgive you. Just... I collect people, and a person with, you know, that kind of problem would have been really great. Collect people? People with different problems. Huh, so you just, like, go around asking people what's wrong with them? Pretty much. I see. With little left to say, Rin resumes her lunch and the conversation dies away. But I keep thinking about what I just said. It's the first time I told anyone else about my condition. All the other people have either known about it already, or heard about it from someone else. Or didn't need to know about it, like every other student here so far. Should I have told her it was... Uh, should I have told it as a natural part of introductions? Is it expected of me? Hi, I'm Hisao. I have a very serious heart condition. Is that how I'm supposed to go around introducing myself from now on? As if our disabilities would define us. What a disgusting thought. Or maybe this Tezuka girl just has an unnatural interest in such things. As I walk to the back of the room to pick up the items on Misha's list, a chance opens to study Rin from the corner of my eye. Her hair is a burnt auburn, almost orange and cropped short. Long hair would probably be impossible with no arms. The boy's uniform and the lack of arms make her look very thin, almost scrawny. She's not particularly pretty, except for her murky green eyes, which flicker restlessly from below her short bangs, even when she eats. <sighs> She's not particularly pretty in a game where every girl is made to look very pretty. I mean, dating sims are all kind of the same in that respect. I don't think you can really look at her and say she's not pretty. The distance in the shadows makes it seem like they don't reflect sunlight at all, but instead absorb all of it within them like deep wells. She moves her feet almost as deftly as a normal person would use their arms. However, I can see how this sight could discomfort people, especially while eating. It makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, at least. I hesitate to think about the word unnatural, but it's too late now, isn't it? I keep searching the cab- C Cabinets? probably, and shelves for Misha's things, but after enough time passes, the silence grows too uncomfortable, so I try to force some conversation out of this strange girl. So, do you always eat alone this late, or do you get the occasional visitor? Visitors. Maybe you are my first occasional visitor, but I don't always eat alone either. Sometimes I eat with a certain person on the roof, if she's not horsing around. Horsing? She likes to do sports. Oh. And that's all I can think of to say. Both of us fall silent again as Dean forks the last bits of her meal to her mouth. I look down at my hall and double check it with Misha's list. It seems I have everything except plywood. Uh, so I think I have all the things now. That's very nice for you. Don't feel obliged to stay. I was about to take a nap anyway. You need to do whatever you're going to do with that stuff anyway, right? Or perhaps you like to watch girls sleeping? Uh, 
I'm not sure what to make of this, but Rin looks serious. Even if I did, I think I have to be going. Uh, I'll catch you around, Tezuka. You can call me Rin. I feel that our relationship is at this point good enough to warrant this much. I was already turning to make my exit, but she draws me back in. Fine, uh, then I'm Hisao. Then you are. Rin looks at me hard in the eyes, but that intimidating feeling you get when someone stares at you isn't there. It's like she's actually not looking at me at all. She blinks a couple of times, and I can't figure out why a pause like this just popped between us out of nowhere. See you later, Hisao. There's something like a tiny smile there in her face. Maybe. I quietly back out of the room. As I shut the door in front of my face, I whisper to myself, What an intriguing person. From inside, I hear a muffled sing-song voice. I heard that... God, what did she hear? <laughs> hey, Misha. I forgot you appeared here. I jump at the sudden appearance of Misha, who I had not heard approaching despite the completely empty hallway. Somehow, she had gotten to jumping distance of me without making a sound. Creepy. It briefly reminds me of Kenji's nutty theory about a global feminist conspiracy, but I push that thought aside. Please do, he said. Please, can I get a version of this with no Kenji? It'd be fantastic. Shizune, standing slightly behind Misha, looks aloof as she couldn't have heard the remark that drew Misha's attention, but Misha is visibly excited. No, wait. More importantly, who is in there? There's no club meetings today. She tries to curiously peek past me, even though the door prevents her from seeing anyway. What are you doing here? You took so long that we had to come check what's wrong. That's no good, Hee-chan. She wags her finger at me scoldingly. No, no, no! <laughs> I found plywood, but everything else is still missing because you are tardy. Uh, sorry. I got the things here, was just going to bring them. I think you were up to some mischief, Hee-chan. Who was in there with you, I wonder? Misha signed something quickly to Shizune, pointing at her own ear a couple times. Shizune immediately pushes her way past me and opens the door into the classroom I just left. I can only imagine the shock she is experiencing. With Shizune's diligence and attitude, the insolence of daring to deface school property by sleeping on top of it must be too much to bear. And indeed, she stares at Rin, frozen in place apart from the slight but noticeable trembling of her shoulders, from suppressed rage, I'm sure. Instead of blowing up, Shizune just takes a few deep breaths, adjusts her glasses, and slams the door shut, turning to sign furiously at Misha. Maybe she did blow up, but I can't understand it. She shoots a very loaded stare at me too, as if it was somehow my fault that Rin is sleeping on one of the tables. What did I do? Don't bother me about this. I hope she's not getting any funny ideas about the reason of my tardiness. Hello. Rin's voice comes from the other side of the door, and it takes a few eye blinks to realize she might have trouble opening it. I open the door to find Rin directly behind it, looking at us with a half-interested, half-sleepy face. Hello? Miss Tezuka, what do you think you are doing? You absolutely are not permitted to use school property for such... Uh, disgraceful? Activity! It sure is suddenly very crowded in here. I didn't know I was this popular. It's hard to say whether she's happy or unhappy about this turn of events. At any rate, she ignores Shizune and Misha's scolding, so they have no choice but to drop the issue. Shizune taps Misha's shoulder, points at Rin, and makes some quick signs. Popularity aside, please don't do that anymore. Anyway, how's your project going? Will it be done for the festival? Rin looks at them blankly, apparently at ease under the pressure Shizune's cold stare is putting on her. I keep wondering about that myself, too. And? We'll think about it harder. As Misha signs her reply to Shizune, her face turns into an unsatisfied frown. Miss Tezuka, please try to take this seriously. It'll be a disaster if the wall looks like someone threw up their lunch onto it. Rin nods assertively. Mm. We'll think more seriously. Misha actually giggles at that, but Shizune doesn't. Not even after translation. She just shakes her head, takes the materials from me, and takes off with Misha in tow. Rin frowns thoughtfully as she looks after the retreating student council duo. 
How rude. It's true, though. I must finish my project before the weekend. There will be dire consequences if I don't. The end of the world as we know it. Like weekends usually are. But more dire. Much more dire. Maybe I'll postpone my nap. To unforeseen future. I'm about to ask what project she has and what are these apocalyptic consequences, but she walks back into the art classroom. Since you have nothing to do, would you give me a hand? This paint can doesn't fit in my bag, but I need it. She kicks lightly at a huge can of paint that's lying on the floor next to the table she was sitting and sleeping on. It lets out a dull clang. Being the gentleman I am, milady. <laughs> I naturally pick it up. Or how about being a decent human being because she asked you nicely for help? Okay, maybe it wasn't the nicest she could have asked, but she wasn't ordering you. Not a gentlemanly thing. Heavy. Yeah, sure. Where do you need to take it? Away. And with that, she takes off to the hallway, me and the paint can following since there's little choice for either of us. The hallway is quiet and empty now with Shizune and Misha gone, so we too leave towards the stairwell at the other end. Every 10 or 15 or 20 steps, I have to change the can from one hand to another, because the thin handle cuts into my palm. At least it keeps my arms from tiring too fast. Dean strolls on beside me with an uneven pace that I have trouble matching. Or maybe I'm walking weird because of the extra weight? It seems one of us is constantly walking too slow or too fast, and I can't figure out which. Two flights of stairs below, trouble appears in the form of the head nurse and his fox-like grin. Ah, Mr. Nakai, what a happy coincidence. Tezuka too, of course. He nods courteously to Rin, who does not acknowledge him back, then turns to me because obviously it's me he had some business with. There is something I forgot to mention on Monday. I nod and wait impassively because I can't even begin to guess what he forgot. The feeling of the handle delving deeper into my skin doesn't make me feel enthusiastic about this interruption, either. It's about your medications. Since you haven't been that long on your current medication, there might be some unexpected side effects, which might require adjusting dosages or even changing to another kind of medication. So we will do a few tests regularly, but what I'd want is for you to keep an eye on everything in your condition that feels off, if you get what I mean. Nausea, headache, anything. And come see me if anything happens. All right. So, how are you? Everything fine? I give up and drop the can to the floor before answering him. Apparently this takes longer than my biceps can handle. I'm about to say something generic as an answer, but then I realize how often I've done that lately. Other people have asked me that too. Teachers and students here, my parents, visitors, nurses, doctors at the hospital. Everyone seems to be concerned about that. It's natural for a hospital, not so much for a school. Except this school. This is a small school and both the student base and the faculty seem to be very tightly knit. At least, that's the feeling I'm getting. And this is not the kind of school that gets transfer students too often. The thought sends shivers up my spine, but I give a generic answer anyway. That's great. Also, one other thing. My sources tell me that you've been at neither the school track nor even the pool, so I'd like to know if you've taken up exercising as I asked. Of course I haven't. But his way of inquiring gives me the feeling that I should have been running my ass off on the track since the very first day. You have people spying on me? Not as such. I just happen to know a few people, but that's not the issue here, so don't try to slip out of it. Well, I was actually just doing some improvised weightlifting as an exercise. I pick up and lift the can up and down a few times, like some sad imitation of a bodybuilder, even though it's weighing down on my arms painfully. The stupid grin disappears from his face for a second, then comes back like it was never gone. Tezuka, would you give us a second? The nurse grabs me by the shoulder without waiting for Rin's permission, which he didn't need in the first place, and drags me aside. When I told you to exercise, I wasn't joking. I understand that you were still on your first week and all, but please don't ignore the importance of this. The reason I'm coming down this hard on you is that your habits are not easy to form. The more you slip and postpone, the harder it'll be. It's the same with everything, like dieting. Can you promise me to be more serious about this from now on? Oh gosh, I don't know if I can. Who can really decide these things? Okay, save that. Return. Hmm. Hmm. How to respond, how to respond. 
Maybe. Maybe. No, I'm... I mean... He gives me a nasty sort of look when I say that, making me try to take back the word. I mean, I don't know. I'm still trying to get used to this school. I promise to try, though. You're not being convi very convincing there, he sow. Tip number one, medical professionals are not amused if you take their advice lightly. What's up with him? As if a day or two would make that much of a difference. I didn't do anything at the hospital, either. I put on, like, 300 pounds. I don't know how he didn't. I mean, maybe they just feed him real well there, but when you're, like, mostly bedridden... Jeez. Yeah, okay. Sorry. He studies me for a moment, and then shrugs, smiling again. Okay, that's more like it. If you go to the school track tomorrow morning, you'll meet my spy, who probably has no qualms offering consultation to you if you want to jog a bit. Consultation? See you around. He leaves with a wave of his hand, and no answer, and I walk to Dean, who has been waiting, idly leaning against the hallway and, starting to, and staring at the pale lighting fixtures in the ceiling. Even when I approach, she doesn't move her eyes off them. Are you getting medications for your heart thingy? Were you listening? It comes out more accusatory than I intended, accidentally lashing out on her. But even so, I don't really want to start talking about it. I just met her. I don't know her. It's none of her business. The nurse seems to be happily ignorant about my confidentiality, too, talking about that kind of thing in public. But it's not Dean's fault, is it? I look up at her, suddenly feeling a bit guilty, but Dean is just staring past my shoulder quizzically, her head tilted like a bird's. <sighs> I don't know why this is so hard for me. It feels like there's some inexplicable lock that prevents me from being more upfront about this. Yeah, there for my heart. Will they make you better? No, not really. They just make me a little less worse. Dean keeps looking at me for a while longer, and she neither says anything further nor displays any kind of emotion I could discern. I'm thankful that she doesn't. I think I'm still not quite used to all this. At the hospital, it was easy, but I still haven't sorted my feelings about having to live a normal life with this disability. We leave the main building, and Ian leads us onwards towards the dorm. We stop at the small patch of greenery in front of the dorm building. The dorm is built on a slightly elevated ground, with a wall and a few trees that everyone has to circle around every time they come or go. It's probably the only inconvenient design in the school. The entire wall, made of the same kind of bricks as the building itself, has been covered with some sort of painting. Most of it is still mere sketches, quick lines drawn with black and white against the gray plastering that covers almost the entire length of the wall, but some places look a bit more finished. There are human faces and legs and hands. I can't quite say what the painting as a whole might portray. Stacks of what seem to be paint cans are arranged in piles on the ground, beside the wall. See? The left side is hardly off the ground yet. It's because I couldn't get in the mood yesterday so I gave up and went to meditate instead. Then it was suddenly morning. I have to work on it, but the guys from art class are helping with the negative spaces and base surfaces whenever, which is a problem. It's easier to paint big areas if there are a lot of people with hands. The reach is better, and it's faster too. She goes on a tangent of a tangent, waving, her l waving a little with her arm, or whatever of it there actually is, to demonstrate even though I got the point already. The white cotton of her sleeve flaps around, and it makes me think it could look sadder than it does. But it makes me feel out of place, like almost every tangible reminder of the student base's special properties has in the past few days. This girl doesn't notice my dreary feelings, of course, or the fact that she lost me a while ago, and just keeps blabbering. So that's why I'm trying to figure out if there's something I need to figure out, and then figure out, or then figure that out before it's too late and all hope is lost. Why would the hope be lost? Because paint has to be painted, and then it has to dry, and then it has to be painted over with another kind of paint. It takes time. She finally stops, apparently thinking she made some kind of statement. That makes sense. I think it's best to start from the top. So, this is your project? You did this? Yes. Yes. All of it? Yes. Nice. But... I stumble with my words, and suddenly feeling like I've walked straight into a minefield of political incorrectness. It's okay. You can say it. I probably won't get mad. I blush really hard. 
I don't really know what would be the right thing to say, if any. It feels that I'm way more sensitive than Rin, than Rin is, though. This is really awkward. Don't you want to ask? How do you paint without hands? See? I'm an easy person to talk to, right? With my feet. I almost guessed that already. But isn't that hard to do? You're good at guessing. Anyway, I don't think it is. But maybe I'm used to it by now. I can't get my mind around the fact that she could be an artist. But seeing how adept she was using her feet to eat, I figure painting might not be a problem either. Neither of us has anything more to add to the subject. The afternoon light works pretty well. I was afraid it would look too flat, but it's not like that after all. I think it's actually pretty interesting. I wanted to see what it looks like in dim light. Do you think it's flat? Ah, uh, well, paintings tend to be flat. Not like that flat. You know, flat, like some people are. No substance. No meat where there should be some. I know a few girls who- Oh, okay, I get it. But I couldn't really tell. I'm not that good with art. I can't name many artists or artistic terms. So I don't really have anything to say. Rin shrugs her shoulders at that, saying, Suit yourself, without saying it, and looks up at the sky as if trying to look for something up there. I didn't think I'd get any actual work done, but if you give me a hand with the paints, I could do a little before it gets too dark. I wanted to get a halogen lamp like the ones they have at the sports track, but there aren't any. Rin is sure quick to recruit my help, as was Shizune. It really makes me feel that the festival is such a big project that every pair of hands is needed. Why not? I'm not really sure I can be of any help, though. It's just mixing some paints. You can probably do that. Probably. Do you have motor control problems? Like, you know, those people who have some? Cerebral palsy, maybe? Not that I know of. I get it. Heart thingy has nothing to do with that. She gives me a sly look for no reason. No, it doesn't. Let's do it, then. So she sits on an empty wooden box and very naturally picks up a wide brush between the toes of her bare right foot. I open a few of the cans and pour some of the contents into shallow bowls for mixing. The thick paints flow lazily from the can to the bowl, like syrup. I mix them, creating funny, hypno hypnotic-looking swirl patterns that melt quickly into each other to form a new monotone hue. Rin sets me to work, every now and then asking me for a hand with something or the other. Finding different brushes is easy enough. But mixing the paints to be the exact tone the girl is apparently seeing in her head is a frustrating ordeal. She wants precision down to the last millimeter before she is satisfied, but her instructions are obscure at best. Add half a splash of green. I crouch down to pick up the can of bright green. The other green. This green. I carefully pour some of the other green paint into a mixing bowl. No, that's almost a whole splash. More white. Is green a good color to add? No idea. You're the artist here. A hint of a smile appears in the corners of her mouth. Do you lack an opinion? No, it's just that I have no idea. It's okay, because I just got an idea. Add more white. With this exclamation, I pour a minuscule amount of white into the bowl and mix it. It looks slightly... whiter? That's not good. It has to be like... Like the color when you wake up and you know that you saw the meaning of life in your dream, but can't remember it. Maybe it's yellow. Despite the impossibility of mixing a color like the change of seasons or any other nonsense that's being imposed on me, I find myself enjoying it more than I thought I would. Whew, alright, well we're running a little long on this one, so I should leave this one here. I was waiting for a scene transition, I was like, ah, I thought there was going to be one before the paint mixing ordeal, but apparently not. I'm going to leave this episode here. We have now met our artist friend, Rin Tezuka, our sporty friend. Emi... Why... Ibarazaki? Sounds right. Student Council President Shizune Hakamichi? Uh... Misha? I only know her as Misha. Misha? Lily Sato? Our, uh... Prim and Proper Tea? Friend? And then, um... Oh, Hanako, what's your last name? I don't remember. I don't remember Hanukkah's last name either. But I did I did look it up, and her name actually does use the kanji for flower. A different kanji for flower? It almost seems like an alternate. When I looked up that kanji, it took me to the kanji for flower that I knew. So, I don't know. 
I'm not far enough into my Japanese studies to to know that. I probably only know like 400 kanji, which is like what first grade, second grade level, maybe. <laughs> It'll take time, I'm sure. I'm supposed to remind you to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Until next time on Katawa Shoujo, goodbye.